Now we're going to start talking about the judgment. What Daniel, and for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about the judgment. So this means we're going to talk about when the, where the righteous go in the judgment, when the judgment happens. Um, we're going to talk about where the wicked go at this judgment time. So to me, it's going to be pretty interesting. This week's a little bit boring yet to me, but, um, but the next couple, three weeks after that are going to be, I think, pretty interesting because that's where my eyes were open to a lot of things I didn't know about the Bible in the past. Would you guys mind standing with me today as I open with prayer? Get you yes, blood yeah. circulating? Huh? You can stand. You'll no, be all right. Oh, you don't, I guess you don't have to stand if you don't want to. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that um, we can be here again together today and to learn more about you. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with us. Help me to say the things that you would want me to say and to not say the things that uh, you would not want me to say. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be attentive to you and your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Daniel's prediction of the judgment. In the last two lessons, this is lesson study number 15. Do you have, do you got one, Stephen? No, I got Let's see, it's Daniel's prediction of the judgment. That, yep. Got the right one, okay. In the last two lessons, we have studied Daniel's amazing prophecy of the pre-advent judgment that began in 1844. We have discovered that the 2300-day prophecy began in 457 BC during the Medo-Persian realm and ended in AD 1844 with the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. In the last lesson, we examined carefully the Old Testament sanctuary service that pointed forward to the ministry of Christ. We found that the three sections of the sanctuary pointed forward to three three phases of the ministry of Christ. The courtyard represented Christ's work of sacrifice, the holy place, his work of intercession, and the most holy place. His work of final, I'm sorry, and the most holy place, his work of final judgment. The work of the courtyard and holy place performed in the ancient Jewish sanctuary every day was known as the daily. The work of the most holy place performed by the high priest on the Day of Atonement, once a year was known as the Yearly. The cleansing of the sanctuary in the Old Testament referred to Christ's work of the final judgment, which Daniel 8.14 indicates will begin at the end of the 2300-year prophecy in 1844. In this lesson, we, will, or we wish to examine the whole concept of the judgment as it appears in Daniel 7, 8, and 9. In fact, the pre-advent judgment seems to be the focal point of these three chapters. Like we learned last week, um, what happened in the sanctuary, there was a lamb that would be slain, that would be sacrificed. Um, we also learned in Daniel, I forgot where it was, but um, how there, was a, there would be two goats chosen at the yearly sacrifice, and, um, but all the sins would be in the Holy of Holies, and then the priest would have to put the sin on one of those goats, and that's where we come up with scapegoat, and would be led out into the wilderness. Um, the sequence of Daniel 7. Give the biblical symbol for Daniel 7 for each of the powers mentioned below. Daniel 7, 1 through 8. You want to read that for us, Justin? First year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while he was on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. 
After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the root. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. All right, so we've been through this before. So number one, letter A, Babylon, was represented by the lion. Medo-Persia, letter B, was represented by the bear. Letter C, Greece, in this instance, was uh, represented by a leopard. Letter D, Pagan Rome, was represented by the dragon. Divided Europe were the ten horns. And the papacy was represented by the little horn that we've learned in previous weeks of our study. I got another question. Yeah. Really to this, but, um, I forgot. Um, <laughs> Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I have that same problem. Yeah. Uh. Movie City made me think of it. See, oh. kids, that's why you don't take um, drugs when you're leprosy. a kid. <laughs> Do they still have leprosy over there? Do they still have leprosy? Lep What is the next scene that Daniel beholds after the papal power holds sway over the earth? Daniel 7, 9, and 10. Jan, you want to read that one? I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand tens, ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. All right, so the next step now, and this is really close to where we're at right now, is um, the court or the judgment was seated and the books were opened. So now we're talking about the judgment. That's kind of all that has to happen now in our world history. Notice very clearly the sequence here in Daniel 7. Daniel portrays a panorama of the nations, each one following the other. The next great scene that Daniel beholds after the reign of the little horn power is none other than the judgment scene. Daniel repeats the sequence of empires a second time in chapter 7. Name the three powers he mentions in Daniel 7, 19 and 20. Justin? Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So this seems to be talking right here at the end of the time. And so um, Daniel repeats the sequence of empires a second time in chapter 7, name the three powers. He now mentions the fourth, letter A is the fourth beast, pagan Rome. 
And then the ten horns, again, is divided, Europe. And the little horn is Papal Rome. Number four, how long does the little horn power prevail against the saints? Daniel 7, 21 and 22. Jen? I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. All right. So how long does the little horn power prevail against the saints? Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. Who are the saints? New Orleans. Huh? The New Orleans saints? Well, there might be one or two saints in there. Those are the professing, believing people in Jesus Christ. Here again, we find Daniel emphasizing the fact that the little horn power prevails over the minds of men until the Ancient of Days, who is God, came and judgment began. Number five, in the third giving of this sequence in Daniel 7, Daniel again mentions the fourth beast, pagan Rome. The ten horns, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, and the little horn, papal Rome. What event does Daniel foretell in Daniel 7, 23 through 26? Justin? But he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first one, and shall subdue three kings. Shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. So there it is, the judgment. What event does Daniel foretell? It's the judgment. Three times in one chapter, Daniel has gone through the same sequence of the nations from Daniel's day to the end of the world. In each case, he ends with the judgment scene. The judgment scene always follows the reign of the little horn power. Number six, how long does a little horn power reign? How long does papal Rome reign? Daniel 7:25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So a time would be one year, times would be two years, and half a time would be a half a year. So that would be three and a half years, which is... Well, it'll explain it in the notes here, so I'll just go with that. Because <laughs> I forgot. I didn't review too much here. So how long is the little power, uh, little power reign? For a time, times, and half a time. The time, times, and half a time equals 1,260 days. There it is. <laughs> or prophetic years, 1,260 years. So you can go back to Lesson 9 if you want to look how they came up with that. The 1260 years began with the destruction of the last of the three powers that prevented the papacy from having full supremacy. The decree of Justinian, which gave the Pope power in the West, was finally put into effect in A.D. 538. In 1798, 1260 years later, French General Berthier, under orders from Napoleon, took the Pope prisoner, ending the temporal sovereignty of the Pope and fulfilling to the very year the 1260-year prophecy. Daniel 7 predicted that this little horn power would control and dominate the saints for this 1260-year period. 
when this period was over, God would convene the judgment. That's why Daniel sees it coming right after the reign of this little horn power. From Daniel 7, we can learn that the judgment occurred sometime after 1798, or certainly after that time. Daniel 8 gives us the final details which pinpoint exactly when the judgment begins. All right, the sequence of Daniel 8. In Daniel 8, we notice that Daniel repeats the same sequence as Daniel 7 for a fourth time. This constant repetition was vividly uh, was to vividly impress upon our minds the importance of the sequence of the events leading up to the judgment. Give the interpretation for each of the symbols listed below in Daniel 8. The interpretation is given in chapter 8, but if you need extra help, review lesson 13. We'll just go through here with the answers to these. The ram uh, in Daniel 8 was Media Persia. Just reviewing again, the male goat was Greece. The notable horn on the male goat was Alexander the Great. Letter D, the four horns that came up were four divisions of Greece. And E, the little horn, was pagan Rome, and the little horn waxed great in, and that was uh, papal Rome. So what is, what is E? Uh, pagan Rome. You know, pagan Rome, papal Rome, um, kind of were one and the same. I mean, you know, the pagan Rome became a religious power, which would became the papal Rome. Notice again how Daniel has repeated the sequence in Daniel 7, with a few added details. According to Daniel 8, what is the next thing that happens after the reign of the little horn? Daniel 8, 13, and 14. Jan, you want to read that? Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, and the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So, the sanctuary would be cleansed. The cleansing of the sanctuary is a parallel to the judgment. In Daniel 7, the judgment scene is the event that follows the reign of the little horn. In Daniel 8, the event pictured is a cleansing of the sanctuary. From our study of the ancient Jewish sanctuary, we have learned, however, that the cleansing of the sanctuary referred to the work of judgment. Whereas Daniel 7 gave us the approximate time for the beginning of the judgment, sometime after 1798, Daniel 8 gives us the exact details. It starts at the end of the 2300 days in 1844. Number 9, notice in the chart below how these chapters parallel each other. So yeah, there's... Um, a good explanation. It just kind of repeats itself over and over. All right. Last week I had a little break right in the middle, so I'm going to take a little time for a little funny video again. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. So back to the Bible study. Hopefully that didn't distract you too much. <laughs> but. I've seen that too, you know, with dogs. I'm trying to train my one little dog. I give it a doggy biscuit. I'm trying to train her to go give it to the bigger dog. <laughs> it's not working at all. I don't know. It, I think that'd be such a cool trick. I could, you could get, you know, I could be a social media king then, you know. Yeah. It's like watching this. Yeah, watch the dog given the a doggy biscuit to the other dog. All right. 
So, the good news of the judgment. Amazing, exciting, wonderful news. God's judgment has already begun in heaven and has been going on there since 1844. To some people, judgment is scary and is bad news. But in scripture, judgment is always treated as, as good news for God's people, not bad news. What is declared in heaven when God's judgment are made manifest? Daniel, or Revelation 19, 1 through 3. Justin? After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. The true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. The great harlot. It probably has to be none other than papal Rome. So what is declared in heaven when God's judgments are made manifest? Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Excuse you. <laughs> Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. It seems incredible, but all heaven goes into the greatest description of praise to God because he has manifested his judgments. Revelation 14, 6 through 12 describe a special message that is to go into the world at the end time. It is symbolized by three angels flying in the midst of heaven proclaiming this message. Justin, you want to read that too? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, and the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the uh, patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right, so a lot of symbolism again there in Revelation that confirms a lot of what Daniel's saying. Um, do you want to read Revelation 14:7? Uh, Again. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So, what does the um, first angel's message proclaim about the judgment? The hour of his judgment has come. Notice the present tense of this verse. When the special message is proclaimed, the judgment is not future, it is not past, it is actually in progress. The message of the judgment in session could only be proclaimed since 1844. What three injunctions are given as a result of the judgment being in session? Revelation 14.7. Um, it says in there the answers are fear God, give glory to him, and worship him who made heaven and earth. Again, we see praise, honor, and worship given to God because he is at last, he at last has convened the judgment. We must examine why the sanctuary needed to be cleansed. Whoops. I'm sorry. I, I'm not paying. That sneeze threw me off. Who sneezed? Jen? <laughs> I thought, bless you, Jen. I skipped ahead there, so... Um, 
Again, we see praise, honor, and worship of God to, uh, given to God because he at last has convened the judgment. Two aspects of the judgment. The first aspect of the judgment, in order to fully understand what is involved in the pre-advent judgment, we must examine why the sanctuary needed to be cleansed. Number 13, why does Daniel say the sanctuary has to be cleansed? Daniel 8, 13, and 14. Jan, you want to read that? Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And, the, and he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Why did the sanctuary have to be cleansed? Because the sanctuary and the host are trodden, trodden underfoot. Daniel indicates the reason why the sanctuary needs to be cleansed is the sin of the little horn. Number 14, what did the little horn do to God's sanctuary? Daniel 8, 11, and 12. Justin? So he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And the daily sacrifices were taken away. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. And he cast truth to the ground. There are four great sins that Daniel charges to the little horn in Daniel 8 that necessi necessitate the cleansing of the sanctuary. He magnified himself to the prince of the host. This refers to the papacy's claim to be equal with God. See lesson 9. He has taken away the daily sacrifice in the Old Testament sanctuary service. The daily referred to the work of the courtyard in the holy place, Christ's work of sacrifice, and intercession. The little horn has destroyed, destroyed Christ's sacrifice and intercession by instituting the daily <laughs> sacrifice of the Mass for the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Instead of Jesus dying once for all on the cross, the papal system sacrifices Christ every time the Mass is conducted. The system also destroys Christ's work of intercession by causing people to turn to the confessional box for forgiveness of sin instead of pointing them to the intercessory work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus, as our only mediator, forgives us of our sins. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. The place of God's sanctuary in the New Testament times is the heavenly sanctuary. Instead of pointing people to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ is minister, the papal system has pointed them to an earthly priestly system. He cast truth down to the ground. The papacy has taken the great truth of the heavenly sanctuary and made it an earthly system. As a result, people are trying to find salvation in an earthly system instead of seeking to find it in a heavenly sanctuary. It is because of these very doctrines that the Roman system comes under the judgment of God. It is partially because of this corruption of the sanctuary truth by the papacy that Daniel reveals that the sanctuary must be cleansed or restored to its rightful place. Once again, people must be led to see the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Thus we see the sanctuary needs to be cleansed because the little horn has made the work of Christ a work on earth instead of a work in the heavenly sanctuary. Anyone have any thoughts or comments on that? Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest things is, is we're not to follow after man, you know, not follow after, you know, any minister. Sometimes we tend to idolize and hold people in high esteem, but you always got to check things out with scripture. Um, 
like I mentioned before, a lot of times I'll listen to preachers or teachers, well now on the internet more than TV, and a lot of preachers and teachers do a lot of misleading to Christian people. And um, we should never um, give people, idolize people like that. A lot of times you, you know, see people, you know, when the Pope is traveling around the world or whatever, and how they um, essentially worship the Pope. Um, and that's blasphemous, you know? We're not to worship any man, any fallible man. And um, he is a fallible man, uh, unlike what others might teach or whatever. So, well, he, he said to go down that road, anyhow. Go down what road? Twisting stuff around the papacy. The papal? Well, yeah, money, power, good, good answers, I would say. Um, it's, yeah, it's one of those things, and it's, and it's kind of interesting because in the Reformation, when they were learning, you know, when people who were studying these prophecies were seeing what was happening, that's why they got out of the church. That's why Luther and Wycliffe and a number of these different people separated themselves from the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, because it was leading people astray. It was, um, we're going to still learn a number of different things that um, were changed that a lot of beliefs that we have today in the, in the, uh, you well, know. Why do Catholics look at the, at this here then? Or do you refuse to look at it? Well, <laughs> It's, it's not an easy subject for him to, to take, not at all. Um, in fact, you've heard of the Jesuits. I think I brought that up before. The whole Jesuits is a Catholic organization, and it was to stamp out basically all the teachings of the Reformers. There's a guy by the name of Ribera, I think was his last name, Ribera. He was big into teaching that the 70 weeks of Daniel was this final seven years of tribulation that they took off from that prophecy and they said it's something. The seven. So they had to conjure up a lot of, essentially a lot of lies to cover up what the Bible is teaching. Um, in the next couple weeks, you know, we're going to learn regarding this judgment of a number of things that um, was taught in the church, but they're just people like we were, easily mid misled. And I think it's, you know, it's kind of like, well, what are we, just the right people at the right time to, you know, or are we being misled? We got to be careful. You got to be careful too, because. I'm not a very bright guy, I'm not real smart, <laughs> and I could be misleading, these lessons could be misleading us. So we got to be careful to check it out with scripture, um, because a lot of people will argue against what these lessons are teaching us, but it's right from the Bible. I mean, we're going after, you know, we're going scripture by scripture by scripture by scripture, and we're pulling out a lot of scriptures, and um, I think a lot of times the Roman church, they go outside of the Bible, outside of Scripture, and because they believe that they have that authority to teach what they, you know, teach things like purgatory. Where is that in the Bible? Yeah, you think that they would figure it out and just change their ways and be done with it? Yeah, but why? Well, pride. Why Pride is probably the biggest thing that keeps people from heaven. Italian, I think. right? Yeah. Mafia. <laughs> A lot of, you know, pride always comes into play with these things. And, but those, I, I, I like those questions because I always ask that. I mean. A lot of my thinking had to change when I went through this. It's just like, oh, really? A lot of it was, like, like I say, 
in the next coming couple lessons, a lot of it just totally makes sense to me now. Um, there was a lot of things that I just didn't understand. Um, like the whole idea of eternal torment. Why do people have to burn for a billion trillion years and sit there and suffer? I mean, that can't be fathomable, but we're going to be looking into that and what the Bible really teaches that, or what the Bible really teaches about that. Um, so you'll have to come back for more. And like I say, I'm not going to make you believe any of this. You guys got to believe it for yourself. And I think in the end you'll find that, oh, these are all good arguments. Like I say, if you don't agree with some of it, then, you know, that's fine. You know, then you come up, everyone comes up with their own thoughts and own, their own ideas. But, um, but don't, just because you disagree with a certain point, I always encourage people, don't stop coming because you don't agree with a certain point. Because if, if uh, I would have stopped my marriage the first time that me and Julie disagreed about something, we wouldn't have lasted probably for more than two days. <laughs> but uh, we agree on most everything. But there are, uh, there are things to this very day that we disagree on. And that's okay. Um, and sometimes we agree to disagree, right? So, but that's just the nature of humanity. So, are we on number 15? In the Old Testament sanctuary service, what necessitated the cleansing of the sanctuary? Leviticus 16:16. 16, 16. That's a lot of this. What we learned last week. Justin, you want to read that? And we shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for all their sins, and he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. What necessitated the cleansing of the sanctuary? The uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all of their sins. Like I say, if you ever disagree with something, that, like a passage of scripture that we bring out, go ahead, bring it up. And if I can help, or my wife or something, uh, we'll try to help explain it if we can. The second thing that necessitated the cleansing of sanctuary was that the sins of God's people had been transferred to the sanctuary through the ministry of Jesus Christ. These sins must be removed through a work of judgment in which it is shown that Satan, <coughs> that Satan, not God, is responsible for sin. Since there are two things that defile the sanctuary, the judgment beginning in 1844 must be a twofold judgment. It must bring judgment for the saints, because Satan is going to accuse us. He's our accuser. He's going to accuse us of all the sins, why should we be allowed in heaven and not that person? Thankfully, Jesus is going to be our lawyer, and we can put our faith and trust that he's going to be <laughs> backing us up. Number two, it must bring judgment for the little horn. In other words, there is a positive and a negative aspect to the judgment. Positively, the judgment will decide in favor of the saints. Negatively, it will decide against the little horn power. Number 16, what message is preached as part of the everlasting gospel? Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We read that earlier. We'll read it again, Justin. And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. The hour of his judgment has come. The gospel is good news that Jesus forgives people of sin through his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary and that no man on earth can forgive sins. When people hear the gospel preached and are pointed to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ is minister, the little horn ceases to have dominion over them. God's judgment on the little horn is heralded by this special, unique message of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, 
that preaches the beginning of the judgment in 1844 and exposes the fallacy of the little horn by pointing people to the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Remember, the message could only be preached since 1844, for it proclaims that the judgment is now in session. Number 17, who else is judged in the pre-advent judgment? Daniel 7, 22. Justin? Until the ancient of days came, and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for saints to possess the kingdom. Who else is judged in the pre-advent judgment? Judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. Similarly, the New International Version translates this text as follows. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, this pre-advent judgment that began in 1844 not only decides negatively against the little horn power, but it decides positively in favor of God's people. Some may wonder why God has a judgment. It needs to be very clear in our thinking that God does not need to have a judgment in order to find out who is going to be saved. God already knows who's going to be saved. God is so fair and just that for the un um, God is uh, so fair and just that for the unfallen angels, He convenes this pre-advent judgment so that it'll be very clear to all of them that God has a right to save everyone that He is about to take to heaven. During this pre-advent judgment, pre-advent means the advent of Jesus coming again. So the pre-advent judgment beginning in 1844, God for the first time unveils to the angels and unfallen beings in heaven the names of the saved and then shows the whole universe why he is saving these people. Number 18, with whom does Peter say judgment must begin? 1 Peter 4.17 From the time has come for judgment, With whom does Peter say judgment must begin? It be judgment to begin at the house of God. The judgment of the saints, the believers. This pre-advent judgment is primarily dealing with the righteous. It is God's vindication of his right to save people who have fully surrendered themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. Number 19. Who is to be my lawyer in the judgment? 1 John 2 1. Jen? My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Praise God for Jesus Christ. That He's going to be our advocate. That if we put our faith and trust, that's the answer, Jesus Christ. Justin, so, that's the answer. Mary and Joe, was that their last name, Christ? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's, it, I think it'd be better to say he would be Jesus the Christ. Christ okay. means the anointed one of Messiah. Yeah. yeah. So that's that, all that means. That name was already predestined for him, waiting for him when he was born? Well, he was told to be called and the anointed one. And so, in a way, yeah, because the anointed one, and that's what Christ means. What was Mary and Joseph's name? I don't know if they were. They were of Arimathea, was it? No, no, that was uh, Joseph of yeah, Nazareth, Galilee. Galilee and <laughs> well, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, all of our initials, you know, are J.C., where did Julie go? Gosh, the one she time... She might have went to get ketchup because she did say that she forgot ketchup. Oh, she... She could have sent Justin. Because it's Mother's Day. And I was just going to tell her how much wow. I appreciated her in front of everybody. Yeah, tomorrow. Mother's Day tomorrow. And so... So you're taking her on a cruise? <laughs> Why not? Um... But I want to 
And thank you, Justin, for doing all those slides that you do. He does all that, so. Are you going to stay for a word of prayer first? Oh, sure. There. All right. Get the Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this lesson and what we have learned here, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us. I pray for Sue um, with the health issues that she's dealing with, that you would, if you could, if you would, that you could heal her and make her whole again and um, be with her as she's going through these things. I know Mike's not here today, too, and I know he's going through a lot of health problems. And um, I pray, Lord, that you would help us um, to walk in your ways, to do your will this coming week, and bring us back together again next week. I thank you for this food that we are about to eat, and I pray that you'd bless it. In Jesus' name, amen.